So uh, what I'm going to tell you about today is the two, two of the stories that are going on in the lab. Um, and we are interested in mechanisms that regulate al uh, alternative pollination and alternative splicing um, in a way that they can regulate gene expression. And uh, because I know that uh, there are uh, some of the people in the public may not be very familiar with some of the concepts, although I expect them all be familiar with alternative splicing. Um, I'm going to uh, give a brief introduction on what gene expression is. And of course, gene expression, and with all these studies on gene expression, um, um, especially high throughput genomic uh, uh, gene expression studies, uh, people tend to uh, forget a little bit about the several steps that there are uh, during the life of an um, mRNA that will give rise to a protein. Uh, just to get things um, on perspective, so this is the nucleus where you have genes or uh, transcriptional units with exons and introns. Um, that gene is transcribed by RNA pole 2 normally. Um, during transcription occurs several steps of RNA processing that are really important for the life of the mRNA. Uh, in particular, 5' prime capping, the splicing of the entrance, and also mRNA 3' prime formation with the addition of a poly -HL. There might be some editing going on around uh, in the nucleus as well. Only when um, um, an mRNA has a 5' prime cap, uh, the, the splicing of the interns made and the poly -HL added now can be exported to the cytoplasm where it can be regulated in several ways. It can go to uh, decay, it can be silenced by microRNA silencing mechanisms, or eventually will be translated into a protein. So uh, the steps that I'm going to uh, focus today is uh, the alternative splicing and alternative pollination. And of course, uh, this is all always um, a mystery uh, for some people because it's all about ATGs and Cs and how the message are made from one single stretch of DNA. And indeed, you can have a lot of different ways of reading the, 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 the coding, the, the genome. And um, it really depends on the way you read it, then you can have completely different sentences being made or messages being made. So if you think about that as messenger mRNAs, you can have completely different um, sentences with different, um, um, you know, uh, senses. So, um, as I've told you, um, I'm interested in understanding in depth the molecular mechanisms involved in regulation of gene expression, in alternative pollination and alternative splicing, and um, bear in mind that uh, pre-mRNA processing in most is mostly coupled to transcription. So that means that during transcription by RNA pole 2, you have processing of the pre-mRNA occurring at the same time. Uh, you have capping, splicing, and also pollination. And it's also through the CTD, mainly through the CTD of RNA pol 2 that some of the factors involved in the processing of the pre-mRNA are targeted to the pre-mRNA and act on it. Um, so to, this is a very simple slide. Just remember that uh, when RNA pol 2 binds to the promoter to form the pre-initiation complex, it is uh, interesting that you already have one of the cleavage and pollination specificity factors that will act on the three prime end of the RNA at the end of the gene. So um, right in the beginning, you already have some components that will be needed at the end of transcription. Uh, during transcription, now af immediately after, you have capping occurring through the cap binding complex uh, proteins that are recruited to the 5 prime end and adding a cap that will protect the mRNA from degradation from 5 prime to 3 prime. And you have splicing occurring as well during transcription elongation. And I'm not going to explain splicing. This is just to tell you that it is occurring mostly during transcription and it requires the, the, the several elements present in the boundaries between interns and exons. Um, maybe Russia should come here now and <laughs> explain a little bit of that. And, uh, and then you have the assembly of several core and basal splicing factors like U1, U2, uh, and U4, U6, U5. Um, that will act on the pre-mRNA to excise the entrance and ligate the two exons that is uh, acting up on, uh, uh, on that particular space. 
Now, for um, what happens at the end of the gene, so the, the, the RNA pool 2 must know exactly where to stop when it's transcribing a transcription unit. It, and this, in some, most of the cases, is signaled by a poly A signal that is present in the DNA, like AT, AAA, um, but also by other elements. And why is this important? Well, RNA pool 2 must terminate immediately, immediately, not immediately, but shortly after uh, the end of the gene, because otherwise it will invade the next downstream promoter and will interfere with the description of the next downstream gene. Also, it is necessary for the process of, um, of uh, cleavage and pollination of the pre mRNA to, to take place. The way termination occurs in high eukaryotes has been um, still poorly understood, but there are some hints. Um, so there is a cleavage of the pre mRNA by the polyethylation cleavage machinery, and then the piece of RNA that is still uh, bound to RNA pol 2 after passing the poly A signal now is degraded by uh, an exonuclease called XRN2. And then um, after some remodeling of the complex, release of some th of the elongation factors necessary for RNA pol 2 transcribe, also some chromatin uh, remodeling factors, and in some cases, pausing factors in the DNA uh, then RNA pol 2 disengaged from, from the DNA template and can be recycled to make another round of transcription. So basically, uh, in the end, you have displacement of RNA pol 2 from the DNA and you have release of the pre mRNA that is now properly uh, capped, spliced, and pollinated. And uh, now it can be exported to the cytoplasm and eventually be translated into the protein. Now in mammals and virus, the, the poly-A signals, so the signals that are important for the three prime information of the, of the mRNA, are quite well characterized. And there is an eczema that is uh, in, in most cases an AAU, AAA in the pre-mRNA. It can be present in some variations of these uh, sequence that is required for um, poly cleavage and pollination to take place. Also, the distance that is between this eczema and the cleavage site is important, that is 10 to 30 nucleotides, and then the presence of a downstream sequence element that is rich in GUs or Us uh, immediately after or within a region uh, within 30 nucleotides, more or less, uh, that is necessary for efficiency of the of the cleavage and pollination. There is also upstream sequence elements that are normally U-reach elements that are present uh, upstream of the poly signal, and these act as auxiliary elements. So these are the core, this is the core element per se, and also this one is considered a core element, but these are also auxiliary elements for the process of cleavage and pollination. Now, the mRNA uh, three prime information is, um, um, is, is then um, made by two processes. First, the cleavage of the pre mRNA, then the polymerization of a poly HL. But these two steps are, uh, cannot be dissociated in vivo because they're very fast. So, cleavage immediately after cleavage, then a poly HL is added. Um, but you can separate them in vitro, manipulating the conditions in order for poly A polymerase to act or uh, to be inhibited if you want to study only cleavage. So in the Eppendorf tube, you can indeed, um, by using nuclear extracts and different concentrations of magnesium or EDTA, you can indeed uh, study these two processes uh, differently and separately. Now, it is, it is a simple process, although the, in the last report, there were, um, there were um, described 85 proteins involved on it. So it's quite, it, might be, uh, it may be a bit more complicated than initially thought. Um, you have, uh, first, uh, the binding of CPSF to the poly signal. CPSF is a cleavage pollination specificity factor that has several subunits, and it's through the 160 kilodalton subunit that it binds to the RNA. Then um, CSTF, that stands for cleavage stimulation factor, binds to the GUU reach downstream sequence element, also has three subunits, and it's the 64 kilodalton RNA um, uh, with RNA binding domains a subunit that binds the, to, the D, uh, to the RNA. 
and uh, the interaction between these two um, uh, factors uh, will um, enhance the cleavage that occurs between them. Uh, there's cleavage factor one and cleavage factor two involved in the process, although they do not provide the cleavage endonuclease, uh, which is done by the subunit of 73 kilodalton of CPSF. Uh, human FIP1, or FIP1 um, was shown to bind to the upstream sequence element, and simplekin uh, seems to be acting as a platform protein for this complex to assemble and uh, um, the process to occur. So after cleavage, CPSF is still binding to the poly A signal, and then poly A polymerase polymerizes the poly A tail, uh, which is normally, as I've just told you, after a CA. Poly A tail uh, is covered by poly A binding protein that is in nucleus, uh, in nucleus is uh, called PAPN1, uh, which may define the, the, the length, uh, but is also involved in the transport of the mRNA to the cytoplasm and then in the cytoplasm to the translation of the mRNA into protein. Now, um, Again, uh, this is all very nice, and these are the basic mechanisms of pollination, but again, we don't know exactly what happens uh, when uh, you have a big, a big chunk of DNA and want to make an mRNA, and how does it occur? Uh, now, for splicing, you probably have heard that there are uh, several types of alternative splicing. Um, most of the human genes are alternative spliced. Um, not so many as shown, so not, not so, so many alternative splicing events have been shown to be um, physiologically important. And uh, of course, in this, uh, in this institute, you have a few um, uh, uh, done by, uh, studied by research groups uh, uh, like SMN and um, cystic fibrosis that have uh, are diseases correlated with, with, uh, with defects in splicing. Um, but apart from those, there are not so many. Uh, still, you still have 95% of human genes at least that are alternative spliced. It, it can go through um, exon skipping, like an exon is present in some mRNAs, but it's not present in others, depending on the cell type or the disease. Uh, it can be the way uh, it is shown here by mutually exclusive exons. You either have one or the other exon inserted into the message. Alternative five, five prime splice sites, alternative three prime splice sites, or th through intron retention. And it's more or less the same for alternative pollination. Like um, it, it, it uh, poly A signals, it's an eczema, right? A AUAA. And you can find AUAA is all over the place <coughs> in a gene. So why you should have, at the end of the gene, one that is recognized as such. And indeed, there are some uh, poly A signals within the coding region, or introns, or exons, and also in the tri then can be rec recognized. And for those that are recognized within the coding region, or within introns, now they can produce two different mRNAs. And these two are classical examples that you can find in textbooks, really. So the first one is the case of calcitonin or calcitonin gene-related peptide um, that uh, in the thyroid, this poly A signal present in this intron is recognized and now the machinery will make this um, mRNA encode uh, with exon 1 and 2 and ending in PA1. Now, uh, calcitonin has a specific role in the thyroid that is completely different from the uh, role of CG related peptide uh, producing neurons that will skip exon 2 and will um, choose the poly signal that is present in the 3' UTR. So in these, in these um, cells, now you have skipping of exon 2 and you have recognition of PA2 and you do not recognize PA1 as a true poly signal. So these two messages will have completely different functions because they produce different proteins in different cells. The same for um, the immunoglobulin. So in this situation, in pre B and B cells, you have the membrane bound uh, um, form of the protein that is made with by, by uh, translating this uh, mRNA that has, has been produced by uh, choosing the poly A signal in the prime ETR. However, in plasma cells, you have recognition of a poly A signal in the exon um, in by conjunction with alternative splicing uh, will 
be acting as a true polio signal and will produce a shorter mRNA that will um, make the protein that is secreted. So again, this is another example where you have um, two different messages with two different, uh, giving rise to two different proteins with different functions in different cells. Now, for those genes that have more than one poly signal in the trypamia and this for many years was completely disregarded because people thought, well, you know, if the machinery does not recognize the first poly signal, it will recognize the second poly signal, so, you know, the coding region will be the same within the two different mRNAs. Um, well, this has been, uh, has been, stu has been studied lately uh, as a um, very common phenomenon to have more than one polysignal in trypamia It's called tandem polysignals, if you want. And the characteristic of the mRNAs that are made is that if they do not suffer alternative splicing, now they have the same coding region, but they have different three prime ETRs within it. And with, the, with, the, with all the RNA-seq uh, transcriptomics um, high throughput um, uh, studies that have been made during the last 10 years or so, uh, it has been shown that uh, indeed the there is a specific pattern of choice of the poly signal in the three prime UTR depending on the, uh, a specific cellular program. For example, in cancer cells, uh, most of the genes choose the proximal poly A uh, instead of the distal poly A, producing mRNAs that have shorter three prime UTRs. Uh, during development, on the contrary, you have uh, preferential choice of the distal poly A signal. So the message is, is, is longer, uh, the three prime UTR is longer uh, in most of the genes. So there are a few uh, cases where w people have shown a correlation between a specific cellular program and uh, usage of one or the other poly signal, more proximal, more distal in the three prime UTR. Again, the coding region is the same. It's only the three prime UTR that is changing. Uh, it has been put, been put forward um, the idea that for cancer cells, for example, because the longer mRNA may have microRNA uh, binding sites, then this may be a way of escaping microRNA silencing mechanisms for cancer cells. Uh, I'm not quite sure whether uh, that's the rule, um, in particular because people are starting to look at um, polysome profiling genome-wide again, and they are not seeing a correlation between the length of the transcript and translation into uh, more, pro more or less protein, genome-wide. So more and more, I, I think that maybe with um, this is more, uh, is more gene or cell specific than anything else. So what I will tell you about now is the work that I've been doing. One is um, what is the physiological functions of alternative pollination in the three prime UTR in terms of the organism. And because it's, this is uh, um, a question that we cannot do in humans and it's difficult to do in mice, now we choose Drosophila and also because we've been doing uh, Drosophila work for many years now. Um, because here we can exactly address uh, the, the physiological function of this process. The other uh, story I'll tell you about is how does T cell activation, so I'm talking about human T cells, um, how activation regulates um, CD6 alternative splicing. So first story, uh, this was wor work done by, started by Pedro Pinto, a PhD in the lab, and then followed by Telmo Henriques, another PhD in the lab. Telmo is now in Karen Nagelsmann uh, group, and Pedro is now in Heidelberg. So the, um, the gene that we looked at as a model gene was Polo. Polo is a founder member of, a cell of the cell cycle uh, family uh, Polo lycanase 1. Uh, so um, it was described in the 80s as a gene that would affect almost all step steps of the cell cycle. It's a serine threonine protein kinase, and indeed it is required for mitotic entries, spindle organization, congression of chromosomes, metaphase and phase transition, cystochromatin separation, cytokinases, centrosome replication, maturation, and CDC25 activation. 
Now, why did I choose Polo? Because uh, I was involved in the cloning of the gene and also because I knew that Polo uh, had two mRNAs being formed by different utilization of two poly signals in the 3' ETR. Um, so the first poly signal is the ATTAAA and the second one is AATATA. These are not, um, I mean, in, in Drosophila, signals are conserved as in humans and also the machinery is conserved. It's very well conserved in terms of function and and protein. Um, and um, in 32% of the cases, this signal is, is used. In 10% of the cases, this signal is used. This means that, that this is a weak signal, and this is more or less kind of strong signal. Weak and strong, I, I mean deficiency of the signal in being recognized by the machinery in being used. Um, so it has two mRNAs by Norden. Uh, you can't see here probably, but it is the, the bands are there. Uh, so basically the first one seems a little bit more um, uh, stronger than the, than the second one, which means that this is a bit more used than the second one. Uh, and the, the first question we did was what happens if we mutate one or the other polysignal? Because uh, if you mutate one or the other, you still have the other mRNA that can be used. So what happened to the fly? Um, and um, we were very surprised, well, for that we did transgenic flies, uh, inserting the old genome, the old Polo um, genomic sequence. So Polo contains uh, five exons, all the introns. Uh, we linked GFP to the first uh, exon, so we used it in microscopy. Um, and we have uh, in what we call GFP Polo wild type, our control, we have the three prime ETR with the two poly signals. These flies are absolutely normal, so this is the abdomen of an adult fly, and that's how it should be with all the segments right there being well formed. Now, when we delete or we mutate the first poly signal, we, we just change two nucleotides in the first poly signal. Uh, this signal is not used, uh, the second one is, so now you produce the, the longer mRNA, and you do not see a big effect. Uh, on, the, f on the, the abdomen of the flies. You see a little bit of a nix right there, but nothing special. The flies are happy, fertile, viable, and everything. Now, when you delete the second poly signal of the construct, uh, the fly dies, uh, and dies during metamorphosis due to big, big, big uh, defects in the abdomen. This was quite surprising because you still produce the shorter mRNA. So we would expect, well, we were very pleased with this result, but uh, the bad news would be if we didn't have anything because we still have the shorter mRNA being there. Right, so these flies die um, it during, so this is the life cycle of, the, of Drosophila. Um, so the females lay the eggs, the, the eggs will develop into larvae and then uh, form a pupa and uh, in within the pupa, the organism suffers metamorphosis and uh, gets out as an adult fly. Uh, so these guys die here, um, and, and of course these transgenic flies have an all uh, endogenous polo, so, uh, the fo which is polo 9. Polo 9 dies, uh, dies around here, so this is indeed a problem of not having the longer polo mRNA in those flies. Because Pietro had seen this uh, main problem in the abdomen of the fly, then he went to look into the precursor cells of the abdomen, because that was very specific. So we wanted to understand exactly what was going on and why on that particular cells. And the abdomen of the fly is made by some or, um, a, a group of uh, cells called histoblasts, um, which are um, positioned in the nests. Uh, and these, f these cells uh, will uh, proliferate and expand in a way of making the abdomen or uh, the back of the fly. So. Uh, these flies are very tiny in comparison to, 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 to the, the larva cells. And here you see that uh, these, the, the histoblasts, which, which, which are these little uh, white dots right here, uh, are present and do proliferate in um, fly, fly that do not have uh, the, poly, the first poly signal but you cannot find them in Delta poly A2 transgenic flies. That means that in Delta poly A2 flies, we do not see proliferation of the histoblasts. Uh, here, these, uh, these cells are proliferating and will replace all the larvae cells right there. 
Now, um, because we could not see proliferation of those cells, we thought, what about poloprotein? Because maybe, I mean, polo is a cell cycle protein, so it may be required, or is definitely required for proliferation of the cells. So because we had GFP linked to the first exon, now we could label with GFP, and we could see that uh, GFP polo has normal levels, and delta poly one also for polo, but not a delta poly A2 flies. That means that these flies do not proliferate because they do not do don't have enough amounts of polo in the cells. Right. Um, then again, they still have the shorter mRNA, okay? And um, the thing here is that why this mRNA is not um, being translated into the correct amount of protein. Uh, it may be because we have um, some proteins binding to it in a way that is inhibiting translation. Um, and again, it tells you something about the three prime UTR har harboring very important regulatory elements because in these two MRIs, you're only changing the three prime UTR. Um, when we looked at the stability of the two mRNAs, because that could be a possibility that the mRNA was not stable enough, so we could not get enough amounts of protein, they are equally stable, so that wasn't a problem. But now when we did um, luciferase assays where we put a reporter luciferase gene uh, upstream of the shorter three prime UTR or the longer three prime UTR, we see that the longer 3 prime UTR gives a lot more. Uh, it's about uh, 2.5 or 3-fold uh, increase uh, at the levels of luciferase. So indeed, together with the previous result, this tells us that the longer 3 prime UTR originates more protein or is responsible for, um, for polo protein production more than the shorter. And that's why we do not see um, proliferation of the histoblast because you do not have enough polo uh, for them to proliferate. Now, um, another uh, thing that we wanted to, to investigate is that, well, we could, we could find a relationship between the, these um, uh, two mRNAs and the level of the protein. So apparently, poloprotein was controlled somehow by these two mRNAs. So we asked the question of whether, if we exp overexpress polo, what happens to the to the choice of the poly signal. Uh, for that, we used another drosophila trick that was using a UAS GAL4 system, where he crossed flies containing UAS with flies containing GAL4 and polo um, in order to uh, the overexpression to be uh, driven to the brain. So basically, the brain of the progeny of the flies will have um, an increase in polo production. Now, in the brains, when we analyze the levels of the two mRNAs by qPCR, we see that in when we have overexpression of polo, we, we have more usage of the proximal poly signal, and that results in lower amounts of the protein as we expect, because now we, we we're making the smaller mRNA. Uh, this is quite a, an interesting observation, and we're following up this, uh, this initial observation. Uh, uh, we still don't understand what's going on here. But this is a mechanism that we came up with um, when, when we reached this point of, of our research. So basically, Polo produces two mRNAs uh, in order to control uh, its, own levels of the, uh, its own levels of protein. The longer one will uh, be translated into a lot more protein than the shorter one that eventually will, will uh, give so, so, so little uh, Polo that the flies will die. Now, we do see a defect in, in metamorphosis because uh, um, it's that at, particular st at that particular stage, it's the first time during drosophila development where you have very rapid cell divisions of the histoblasts, these cells that are going to, be f to form the, the abdomen. And because they're very, very fast, now you require a lot of polo for the cell cycle to, to, to go through. And that's why we see the defect exactly in that particular stage of development. Now, the question we wanted to ask afterwards is that because we know that um, uh, pollination and alternative pollination is coupled to transcription, we, we, and in a parallel to, alternative to the alternative splicing fields, we wanted to ask how uh, transcription would affect pollination uh, site selection. So we used. Um, uh, 
a mutant, a fly mutant, that is called a C4 mutant, that has a single point mutation in the larger subunit of RNA pol 2 and that causes a 50 de percent decrease uh, in the elongation rate of uh, RNA pol 2 uh, Using those flies, we measured um, the levels of the first or the second uh, poly signal for polo by three prime rays. You can see here that you have a lot more um, the shorter mRNA being formed, although this is not quantitative. So to do the qPCR, uh, we, we did the qPCR and we have exactly the same. And then we had to make for some other genes just to generalize the concept. And indeed, for five out of seven, um, you do see an increase in the choice of the proximal poly A signal uh, um, in those flies. So this means that um, there's a coupling uh, going on again uh, between RNA pol 2 and alternative pollination. Uh, when you have a slow elongation rate, now you have preferentially choice of the first poly signal in the 3' ETR. Um, this is probably because you have a longer time of exposure of the first poly signal in the nascent RNA to the pollination machinery. So it will be recognized by the, the, these proteins and will be used. Uh, when it's fast and now you have the two being produced almost at the same time and now uh, maybe the second one will be chosen. I don't think it's so easy as this model implies, that it's just a kinetic model. It's probably related also to the strength of the efficiency of the signal and also to the recruitment of specific factors, but we still don't have data uh, to show this yet. So the second story that I'm going to tell you about now is in human T cells, and this is alternative splicing of CD6. Uh, uh, this was done by Mafalda Araujo, who was a postdoc in the lab, and uh, Vanya Glari was a PhD student who just finished in December. So it all started in collaboration with Alexandre Ducarmo, who's a T cell signaling person. And uh, he has been studying uh, scavenger receptor cysteine-rich uh, proteins of the T cells for a very long time now. He came to me one day saying, look, there's this CD6 that seems to have um, a shorter isoform. What does it mean? Is it alternative splicing? Um, and, uh, well, we don't know at the time, um, and we decided to collaborate on this. So the CD6 is a transmembrane protein expressed in T cells and B cells. It has three extracellular domains um, that are responsible for uh, the interaction between the T cell and the antigen presenting cell. In particular, domain three of the protein that interacts directly to CD166, which is its uh, ligand in the APC. Now, um, more recently, uh, CD6 has been shown to be associated with uh, uh, multiple sclerosis stability, uh, which raised uh, more interest in the molecule. It, is, uh, show, it has been shown for a while now that CD6 uh, is involved in modulation of the T cell response. So um, there are several independent observations that are um, different. Some of them have shown that it acts as an activator, some others have shown that it acts as an inhibitor. And we believe that it acts as an inhibitor, inhibitory molecule for T cell activation. Because then again, after uh, T cell activation, then you have a lot of signaling going on within the cytoplasm of the T cell through the action of several kinases that bind the cytoplasmic tail of these molecules. So this is to tell you that uh, indeed upon T cell activation you have a shorter isoform of CD6 that lacks domain 3. Um, so this is interesting because domain 3 is the domain that interacts with the ligand. So what happens to those uh, molecules and what happens to the cell? And uh, what happens is that uh, this is an IPC and a T cell and CD6 is labeled red and CD166 is labeled green. So when these two cells interact um, with, within the immunological synapse, you can see accumulation of CD6 and also of CD166, meaning that this interaction is occurring within the immunological synapse. 
Now, when you have this isoform expressed, you no longer see the immunological synapse uh, being formed, or it is there, but now you do not see accumulation of the molecule within the synapse, and you do not see CD1, CD166 um, within the synapse neither. So this means that the alternative pl uh, splicing of this particular molecule will have an impact in uh, the local uh, position, the position of the molecules in the immunological synapse and eventually in T cell activation. So we set up uh, a, a model to uh, study this mechanism and this is just to remind you that um, Domain 3 is coded by exon 5, so the, sp the event of alternative splicing that we are uh, studying here is this one. So in activated T cells, you see skipping of exon 5 mainly, uh, not mainly but also. Uh, although an, in unstimulated T cells, you always see the full length uh, molecule, so exon 4, 5 and 6. So this is represented here with um, human PBMC, so this is uh, before uh, activation, resting cells, you have the shorter, almost inexistent four to six uh, mRNA uh, and uh, the full length mRNA. And then when you activate the cells, now you start to have a lot more of the shorter isoform. When we do the quantification, and here I represent uh, full length over uh, the shorter isoform, you see a decrease upon T cell activation. Now, um, alternative splicing is regulated by several, um, uh, several factors and there are several layers of regulation of alternative splicing. Uh, you have um, the way that the chromatin is packed or unpacked and that can depend on the nucleosomes and histone modifications that will alter the RNA pool to um, uh, accessibility to the gene and also the speed of RNA pool to transcription. Uh, affect alternative splicing. Also, uh, the presence of Cs elements in the pre-mRNA or the presence of transacting factors, protein factors that bind to those Cs elements in the RNA will affect the splicing of a particular intron. So the, we, we had a lot, a lot to look at in the beginning. So what Vanya did for a start was to look at um, RNA pool 2 occupancy throughout the gene by chip. So uh, this is resting in dark and activated in, in light. And as you can see, you do not see a big difference between them. Uh, although uh, you have a lot more of pole 2 over um, uh, probe uh, 1, 4, 5, and 6. We didn't look at the others. It's a big gene. So we wanted to focus on those where alternative splicing was occurring. Um, this is significant, though. So she was quite. Uh, quite uh, excited about these results. And be because this is done in primary T cells, and it takes a lot of donors to, uh, we get puffy coats from the hospital and we extract, uh, isolate T cells and then do the experiments on T cells. Um, sometimes we have to do a lot of experiments because of donor variability. You, you sometimes we get, we get um, uh, um, the, the RNA that we extract from a specific donor does not behave as it should if it was resting. Sometimes it's already activated. So um, in terms of work, it's, it's quite laborious. Um, so also, she's noticed that uh, CD6 expression is increased upon T cell activation. So this tells us that you have more pol 2 around the gene, more transcription going on, and more production of CD6 upon T cell activation. Now, because we have that some particular uh, histone marks, acetylation marks in particular, uh, is uh, present in, in, uh, in, um, in genes that are transcribed, we went to look into histone 3 uh, lysine 9 acetylation mark. Um, and we've seen that is increased upon T cell activation in the promoter and also in the exon that is alternative spliced. So th this tells you that. Um, there is some acetylation mark that seems to be increased upon T cell activation. Now, there's a way of modulating um, the chromatin with uh, drugs. So TSA in dose histone acetylation and opens the chromatin, and cantotepsin will close the chromatin, uh, making it more compact. That's what we did to see a, that with TSA, we had a ratio of full length over a shorter that is decreased in comparison to the control 
and um, the, the opposite is observed when we use cantotepsin. So this, this suggested to us that um, the rate of BOL2 elongation or, uh, could, be, uh, could have a role on the splicing of these particular eggs. And, uh, this is not new, but it's, um, it's um, because Alberto Cornblit has shown that the rate of transcription affects alternate splicing. Um, uh, but in this case, it seems to apply to this particular gene. So the next thing that uh, Vania went to sort out was the elements in the pre-mRNA that could be important for this. Uh, and as you probably know, there are several uh, regulatory elements present in exons and in introns that can act as positive or negative uh, fact, uh, well, regulators for splicing. Normally, um, the elements that bind SR proteins will enhance splicing, and uh, elements that uh, bind HNRNPs will um, uh, silence splicing. This is a general uh, scheme for how splicing can be regulated. So she 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 went to look into the. Um, into the uh, exon 4, exon 5, exon 6, and the entrance uh, uh, around exon 5. And, but in order to look to these elements and uh, to study in more detail and map regulatory elements, you have to use mini genes to start with. Um, so she made this mini gene, and it behaves very well in PBMCs. So we, we transfected PBMCs, endogenous, it's here, and mini gene is here, so it behaves the same. And also, um, it responds to PHA activation as the endogenous gene, so it works perfectly well. Now, um, she did a lot of uh, deletions and mutational analysis of an element that was um, um, conserved within intron 4 um, and showed that there are indeed uh, several elements in the region. It is a big chunk of DNA anyway, so we were expecting to have a lot of, uh, of elements involved. Uh, so basically, this is to tell you we started with this big chunk deleted and it's here. Now to make sure, then this is a shorter one, to make sure that this was not due to positional effect, we substituted by a piece of uh, plasmid and it behaves the same, so that's correct, that is needed. And then she started to dissect uh, smaller amounts of the region. Now, uh, when we look at the region that we thought could be important, of course, we put it in a prediction uh, program to get what proteins could bind to it, and there's a lot of them, of course. Um, the ones that have the highest score, that's the ones we picked it up. And that's uh, SRSF1, HNRNPA1, and SRSF3. So these two would act as um, activators of the splicing, and that would act as a uh, negative, uh, uh, well, factor for the splicing to occur. And indeed, what we did over expression of these uh, proteins, now we find exactly that. So now we have uh, more uh, um, a decrease in the in the ratio in the CD6 delta D3 uh, um, isoform, also for SRSF3, and the opposite for HNRNPA1. To confirm these results, we use knockdown experiments, and we have the opposite effect. So now for SF1 we have an increase, also for SF3, and a decrease for HNRNPA1. Uh, but here the problem is we, we're looking at an effect that is T cell, T cell activation dependent. So we wanted to ask whether or not these protein levels would differ upon T cell activation. And when we looked at the expression by QPCR or uh, Western blot, we observed that only SRSF1 is decreased upon T cell activation. The other two proteins remain the same. So we focused on SRSF1. And uh, we did UV cross-linking assays to show that indeed it could bind to the region that we are looking at. So this is the input and this is the immunoprecipitation with anti-SRSF1 antibody. Now, just to be sure that um, uh, it does bind to, to CD6 and also to see if it is differently recruited to the pre-mRNA, we used uh, RNA immunoprecipitation assays where uh, we, um, we immunoprecipitate uh, SRSF1 and then uh, do qPCR with primers for CD6. 
This is non-transfected cells. Um, this is for um, um, SRSF1, and this is the control. And here you see a big recruitment of SRSF1 to our um, pre-mRNA, so the primers are there. Now, when you activate the cells with PHA, you lose the, this recruitment, meaning that now SRSF1 is not as well recruited as in resting cells. And because we had seen an effect of acetylation uh, during the process, we treat the cells with TSA as before, and we see exactly the same thing. So our model is that uh, in, there's a, uh, well, there are several elements regulating this particular alternate splicing. Uh, in resting cells, we have a lot of SRSF1 around, and it binds to this intronic region that uh, Vanya mapped, and will activate splicing of exon 5, producing the full-length mRNA. In activated cells, now you have more acetylation of the gene, more transcription going on, and also less amounts of SRSF1 that is not recruited to the pre-mRNA, uh, and then it's not acting as a positive uh, factor for uh, splicing, and therefore this exon is skipped, forming exon 4, 5, 4 and 6, pre-mRNA. Um, so these are the, this is the working model that we're working at the moment, and um, um, just to um, now acknowledge the people who did work, Van is not anymore in the lab, she's now as a, a postdoc here at the IMM, and Mafald is a postdoc in Braga. This is a group, uh, it's changed, so this girl now has moved to a PhD program. Um, so Isabel uh, is a postdoc working in T cells. Jaime is working uh, in Drosophila in pollination. Um, Andrea uh, has, uh, is a bridge postdoc between me and another group who works on glia cells in the brain. So she's developing her own uh, project on oligodendrocytes. And these three girls, these, these two girls are moving from the lab. They did their, their master. This one has already done, and this is a new PhD student in the lab. So uh, Nick Prothford Sume in, in, in the University of Oxford, Oxford has helped um, with some reagents and plasmids. Also Chris Smith, David Glover, and Robert White uh, with, um, with, with plasmids and reagents. And thank you for your attention.